Hey everybody, for the record it is 5.15 p.m. on uh, Thursday, January 9th. The City Council is out of executive session. I've called the regular meeting to order. Uh, roll call, all seven council members are here. Welcome to our new uh, council members, Council Member Hornby to my left and Council Member Cuevas to my right. So welcome. We always start with the pledge to our flag. So Council Member Hornby, if you would lead us. Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member Hornby. <clears throat> First item on our agenda this evening will be the consent items, which includes approval of this evening's agenda, uh, the vouchers, and the minutes from our previous meetings. I'd entertain a motion. Here I make a motion to approve the agenda, the vouchers, and minutes from previous meetings. Second. And a motion by Councilmember Huffaker and a second by Councilmember Bailey to approve this evening's consent items, which includes the agenda and vouchers and the minutes from our previous meetings. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on our uh, agenda tonight would be citizens' comment. We'd ask any member of the audience that wish to address the city council that you come up. We'll give you about three minutes. We'd ask for your name and address for the record. And so come on up. Esa Meinig, 1304 Horizon Place, Wenatchee. And I'm here about uh, plastic bags. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council members. I'm here today to ask you for a moratorium on plastic bags. My generation has created the plastic world we live in today. What are the consequences of this great invention? A plastic infestation. Just look at our oceans. Please, a byproduct of polyester is polluting the oyster. Plastic containers and glass bottles with narrow openings are killing the hermit crabs. Other plastic are killing birds. Recently, a whale that was washed up on a beach had her stomach filled with plastic. And this information came out in the Seattle Times. Watch any tube video, YouTube video on this subject and we'll get more information. Close to home, with waterfront development and the increasing availability of recreational activities, along the Columbia River, I have no idea what the environmental consequences will entail years from today. People are responsible or uneducated. <laughs> I have a suggestion. When you go home tonight, look in your cupboards and see how you can minimize the plastic in your household. <clears throat> I did. The reason I'm telling you this is because I care and I want to bring this I want to bring this awareness to you and to the citizens of Wenatchee. As I starting as a starting point, I am asking the city council today to impose a ban within the city limits of Wenatchee on all plastic bags in styrofoam containers on <coughs> grocery stores, restaurants, department stores, and all healthcare facilities and allow only paper bags for a fee. No more plastic options. Other cities have imposed a ban already. According to statistics, statistic, over 120 cities around the world, including Eugene, Oregon, our neighbor Ellensburg, and of course Seattle, impose the use of plastic bags. I wish I could educate the school children generation of today about the consequences of plastic infestation that is choking us today, but I can't. In conclusion, plastic infestation is an inconvenient reality. We cannot close our eyes and ears anymore. We need to be responsible. The future generation is here with us now. They need to be educated. It's not for my generation anymore. It is too late. Please take care today because tomorrow might be too late for you, generation two. Thank you very much. 
Thank you for being here. And, and I'll, I have uh, a packet I would like to leave with you. So if you leave it with the city clerk, she'll make sure that we get all of that. <clears throat> and thank you for being here. Anybody else wish to address the city council on anything tonight that they'd like to? We'd give you three minutes and ask in for your name and address for the record. Seeing no other takers, we will move on to our agenda items. Uh, Frank, first, if I might, yes. I want to remind everybody to speak clearly into your microphone so okay. our listening audience yep. in Radio Land can hear us. Perfect. Uh, so our first uh, presentation tonight is regarding Wenatchee School Choice Week, and I think Councilmember Bailey, do you have that? I have that, Your Honor. Thank you. you. Uh, proclamation, Wenatchee School Choice Week. Whereas all children in Wenatchee should have access to the highest quality education possible, and whereas Wenatchee recognizes the important role that an effective education plays in preparing all students in Wenatchee to be successful adults, and whereas quality education is critically important to the economic vitality of Wenatchee, and whereas Wenatchee is home to a multitude of high-quality public and non-public schools from which parents can choose for their children, in addition to families who educate their children at home, and whereas education, educational variety not only helps to diversify our economy, but also enhances the vibrancy of our community, and whereas Wenatchee has many high-quality teaching professionals in all types of school settings who are committed to educating our children, and whereas School Choice Week is celebrated across the country by millions of students, parents, educators, schools, and organizations to raise awareness of the need for effective educational options. Now, therefore, I, Frank Kuntz, do hereby recognize January 26th through February 1st, 2020, as Wenatchee School Choice Week, and I call this observance to the attention of all of our citizens. In witness whereof, I have caused the seal of the city of Wenatchee to be affixed on this ninth day of January, 2020, Frank J. Kuntz, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Bailey. Is anybody here? Do we know? Pick this up? Okay, we'll make sure it gets to where it needs to be. Uh, next up is our uh, Link Transit Vision 2020 presentation. Richard Durock, how are you this evening? Good. Thank you. So, um, thank you. I wanted to come tonight to give you an update on what our uh, plans are going forward uh, with uh, new services and this with the passage of uh, Prop 1 uh, in August. So um, start with this is planned. Our board has not yet approved the budget to go forward with this. So uh, this is what we have planned and we will find out uh, in two weeks whether we're going forward with this or not. So um, go ahead and get started here. Um, so, Prop 1 went to the voters in August. It passed by a 56 percent, um, well, it's backwards to try that. There we go, okay. Um, by 56 percent in both Schlan and Douglas counties. Uh, what that imposed was a one-tenth sales tax increase, which went into effect January 1st. That should generate about $3.56 million a year in additional revenue for public transportation in our area. Um, might be, if the economy continues to do quite as well as it is right now, might be a bit more than that, because it's actually doing, things have been better than anticipated recently. But that, that's the range of what that's going to be bringing in. Uh, the sales tax was a two-tenths election, but we phased it. So one-tenth went in uh, in January. The second-tenth does not start until January 1st of 2022. And that was for two reasons. One was that we can't actually expand service that fast to spend all the money. And so we said we don't need it because we couldn't hire people. We couldn't buy buses quickly enough to put it all in once and probably didn't make sense to do it that quickly. So we tried to spread it out and not have the impact all hit the citizens all at once going forward. So this is for the first tenth we're talking about as we move forward. Uh, the goals of the expansion, what was in the ballot and what the board worked on was really to to support non-traditional work shifts. The link system for the last 28 years really has focused Monday through Friday, eight to five work shifts. And we do a pretty decent job of that throughout the region. Our system is fairly well covered for those types of issues. We don't cover all the neighborhoods, uh, but for the most jobs that work Monday through Friday, eight to five, it actually does reasonable coverage, provides reasonable service out there. And we've done uh, a good job at meeting those needs. But about half our economy operates 
in the tourism or the agricultural community, which is seven day a week, 24 hour a day. And that we didn't do. We had no Sunday service. We had no service after seven o'clock at night. And we uh, had limited Saturday services. And so for a big chunk of our economy, we really were not meeting the needs that were out there. And we heard loud and clear from the community that was something they were very interested in us expanding to try to address. Uh, we also heard from just people in the community that we were not available to meet the needs to do evening and weekend events. You could not use us to get home from an Apple Sox game. You couldn't go to an event at the pack or go to the movies and use Link because we were shut down by the time anyone would come to come back from those events. And people you know, that are transit dependent and 34% of the population of our community does not have a driver's license, did not have access to those elements. Then also there was a priority to try to do things that would increase the use by visitors and tourists, since that's a significant part of our, market, uh, of our community. And then to make the system more relevant to people just even here in our communities. Jeez, sorry about that. <laughs> so um, sure that moving forward in 2019, because the economy had done fairly well, the board did implement some of the services that were proposed in the ballot a little early. So we were able to add, uh, later evening, weekday and evening service on key routes, primarily in the city of Wenatchee on our routes eight and our route five, um, and uh, the service uh, on our routes A and C, which serve the downtown and connect over to East Wenatchee. Those services at, were extended till nine o'clock at night, uh, starting um, in July and August of last, year, of last year. Those are starting to really turn up, starting to generate some ridership and, and actually do some pretty positive things. We started most of those same routes about an hour earlier in the mornings, and we also extended our Leavenworth and Chelan routes, which were some of the tourist issues. We started our Leavenworth shuttle, which was aimed at two things. One was to serve the tourist community in Leavenworth, but really the major focus there was to keep the Leavenworth route on time <laughs> when the festivals happened because we were losing buses in the traffic in Leavenworth and they wouldn't get back. And while that really wasn't as big an impact on the Leavenworth commuters, the problem was that bus would get stuck up there maybe for an hour, and then it would be so late getting back into Wenatchee that the next trip out to Chelan or the next trip out to Leavenworth or the trip someplace else was more than an hour late. And so we were actually missing service elsewhere in our community because of the delays in the Leavenworth area. So putting a shuttle and truncating the route at the east end of town so that we could keep the schedule working actually was a way of making the system work better for everybody. And that actually has been working pretty effectively in, in at least the most recent months. It took a while for people to get the handle of it, but it's now working well. Then we also started a seasonal shuttle up in, in uh, Chelan over the summer. That was not quite as successful as we, as we would have hoped. So what's proposed going forward for July of 2020, we are looking for additional weekday service. Uh, not a lot, because we've already done most of what we think was necessary really to meet the immediate needs. But here in uh, Wenatchee, we had wanting two additional uh, trips on our Route 1, which serves South Wenatchee. Um, and that's really because we just missed that in the first go round. And that actually is a pr uh, one of the busier routes and a primary, we think, a feeder to the long distance routes for workers that may want to be working in the Leavenworth and Chelan communities that uh, uh, would want to be attracted to that. One additional trip to Chelan in the evening, two additional trips to Leavenworth. Those are midday trips, and that's actually because there's some gaps in the schedule that we've heard that those are important going forward. And then one additional evening trip to Malaga. Right now, the, bus to Mal the last bus to Malaga leaves at 5 o'clock, and so if you get off work at 5, you can't actually get home, uh, which is probably not a great design. Uh, and there are one morning trip in Waterville, and that's because we have a bus that arrives in Waterville at 7.50 in the morning. The next bus leaves Waterville right about 11.15, so you have to sit up there for three or four hours if you go up to pay a bill or do something at the county courthouse, and they wanted something that got back sooner. I think it's actually 2 o'clock it comes back. So this allows someone to go up, do some business, and actually come back within a reasonable time period. Uh, the bigger increases are actually on the weekends, which is what the citizens asked that they wanted. So starting in July, we proposed that we would actually begin service for the first time in many years in East Wenatchee. So East, uh, East Wenatchee would gain 16 additional daily trips. That's our routes 11 and 12. Uh, right now, East Wenatchee has almost no service on Saturdays. <clears throat> they have service that comes from Wenatchee, but there's nothing that actually operates solely within the East Wenatchee area. This would uh, bring service to East Wenatchee on Saturdays. 
Malaga would gain four additional trips on would gain four trips on Saturdays, and Waterville would gain four trips on Saturdays, and that, that hasn't had service in about 12 years to those communities. Uh, we would gain when City of Wenatchee would gain additional 20 trips on Saturday, and that's filling in some gaps, uh, making that service more effective. And that's really earlier and later service for Wenatchee because we've had service here, but it starts about seven o'clock in the morning and ends about five o'clock. And this would take it more about six to seven o'clock, make it work more to meet the connections for the out of town routes and allow people to actually go to work on that for people that want to work. Two additional trips to Rock Island, five additional trips to Leavenworth, two additional trips to Kashmir, and one additional trip to Chelan. Uh, and again, those are meeting specific travel needs we heard from the business community there for people that need to work in the service industry or in the fruit industry that had particular outs where they were having, they had people that live in our communities down here that were having difficulty getting to work and could not use the bus. So that's what those were aimed at. Sunday, we've never operated Sunday in service in 28 years. Our proposal is to start Sunday service in July with a second expansion a year later. We don't think we can do it all at once just because of the scale of what has to be done. But our proposal is to operate three routes in Wenatchee, uh, about 40 trips a day. That's our routes one, so South Wenatchee, our route five, which circulates through Wenatchee, and our route eight, which covers Wenatchee and East Wenatchee, and then also our route A, which goes between our Route 60 goes between the North Valley Mall and Columbia Station. Then between East Wenatchee and Wenatchee, two routes, our Route 8 and our Route A, which go between the two cities, would also operate. And that provides us a distribution system throughout the urban area here that we think is enough to get people to and from our Chelan and Leavenworth trips, which were really what the goal was, because what we heard from those communities was they are desperate for workers and they can't recruit some of the people that live in the, in the valley that have indicated a willingness to work in, the, in some of the service industry jobs that are available up in, the, in their communities, but have no way to get there on the weekends. And so we were really trying to meet that economic -ish need, if you will, with the service design. And so that is what's structured for Sunday service. What comes along with that is our Link Plus service for the elderly and disabled. Um, if you operate additional fixed route service, you have to match that with your paratransit for the special needs population. So we would add additional five daily hours of Link Plus service. And what that really means is because the frequency of service between here and Leverworth increases, we will have to operate more service to locations like Shaston and Dryden where we have not, where we've been kind of skipping them because we don't, weren't frequent enough. This sort of converts it to an, ob to an obligation we have to do legally. So there'll be additional services there for people with disabilities they haven't had in many years. Uh, additional 40 hours of Saturday service. So both because we can operate over a broader area, there'll be services to East Wenatchee and to the outlying communities that has not been there before. Uh, so that'll be new for the citizens that, that use Link Plus. Plus there'll be more hours of service because we operate more hours out there. So even the citizens here will have more opportunity to use Link Plus on Saturdays. And then Sunday, uh, Again, never had this service, and so we expect there'll be a significant <laughs> demand for Sunday service, whether it's just access to, to church or other just recreational services, that'll be out there uh, uh, throughout the service that is defined. And we have to provide Link Plus within three quarters of a mile of every route we operate. So wherever we put a regular bus, that ends up creating a service area for our Link Plus service that goes along with it. This actually is the biggest part of the budget. The Link Plus actually costs more than everything else we're doing because of what, the way that works through. And so the biggest investment here is actually for the services disabled. Now more than likely, the next series of expansions won't actually require any increase in these because we'll have already done the service area and there'll be more on the fixed route side. But in the early phases, you're putting most of it in for services for the disabled community. What that works out to is on an annualized basis, about $2.6 million worth of additional service. Uh, it's about $1.9 million in this year because we're not starting until July, but if you annualize it out, it's about two point, well, almost $2.7 million. About 32,000 hours of service. We operate this year about 111,000, so that's a significant increase, about 26% increase in service. It's about 24 additional operators. Now, not all full-time, but most of them are, would be full-time operators, and that's a significant challenge, and that's the real question for us is we have to get moving on hiring those additional people if we're going to have service in place in July because tight economy, getting people hired and trained takes at least uh, 
eight weeks to go through that, pro well, at least eight weeks of training and probably another two months to get them hired to get into the process. So that has to be moving going forward. For 2021, though this isn't in the budget, this is more what the service plan ha has had in it. It's still out there. Uh, the, ex the proposal for 2021 is to expand Sunday service to match what we do on Saturdays. So there's more operators there, more fixed route. Uh, service into our foothills. Right now, we don't operate <clears throat> up into, we don't operate past Western, for example, in Wenatchee. So this is the area from Western up to the foothills, Sunny Slope, Eagle Rock areas, something that meets those needs. Probably not regular fixed routes, probably some alternative type of service that would meet the lower density areas, Fanshawe Height over in East Wenatchee, the new developments that are out past Kentucky, again, where we've never operated service. We're looking at those expansions to be in a, a year out. Uh, holiday service. Uh, we used to operate on Martin Luther King Presidents and Veterans Day. We proposed to restore those holidays. Those are holidays that many of the businesses operate in our community, particularly in the tourism and service markets. And we've heard that we need to be providing service on those days. We wouldn't operate the other, I think there's four other holidays that we would still shut down on those on. Uh, and I don't think we have any intention to, to operate Christmas and Thanksgiving. We're too small a community to do that. But these were ones that we had specific requests from the business community, and particularly the agriculture community, to provide service on. Uh, same days, what's called DART service in Leavenworth. This is a demand response, and this is a model we're looking at using to serve some of the foothills. So uh, sort of a an Uber type service for transit using a small vehicle as a way to serve low density. We're looking at volunteer driver programs to serve some of our very rural areas. Again, regular buses with, with uh, regular transit operators don't make sense in a lot of our communities. Just they're just too rural really to support that type of service. So something that's more cost effective, but still provides some basic access for some of our citizens. And then van pool and bus pool for some of, particularly for some of our agriculture employers, where again running a regular bus past a, a fruit shed doesn't make a lot of sense because their schedules change all the time. But a van pool program where they can work with their employees and get them to con congregate riding is a way to both open up new opportunities for employment as well as make them more economically viable and make the community work better. So that's the goal for that. And then we want to look, take a significant look, and we have in the budget a study to look at redesigning the urban network here in Wenatchee and East Wenatchee. Um, I firmly believe it does not make sense for us to increase the frequency on the route system we have today, because the route system we have today was designed around coverage. It was designed to provide a, a basic level of coverage to the citizens, reduce their walk distances, but the travel times are not competitive to, to driving. So it works well for people who don't have choices. It doesn't work well for commuters that are making decisions. And in particular, the best example I can give is if you, the, the largest number of employees that work at the hospital, at Central Washington Hospital, live in East Wenatchee, and they actually, we're looking at the plots, live around the intersection, the general intersection of Kentucky and Grant. That's the largest concentration is in that general area of East Wenatchee. The fastest you can get on a bus from that intersection to the Central Washington Hospital in our system today is an hour and 40 minutes. No commuter is going to do that because it takes three transfers and it works through. So we need to get some more direct routes before we ever talk about increasing frequencies to actually work for more discretionary riders. So we need to redesign that and work with both the communities and the citizens on what that looks like before we try to invest in higher frequencies in the system. And that's that also requires more buses. And that's why that's out of wise. So our hope is to redesign that network, take that out to the public in 2021, and then actually roll that out in 2022. And then in 2022 is implement that optimized route structure uh, and add whatever that additional service is at that point, add key frequency to the, some of those routes. And then we've got a number of park and rides that we've committed to in our plan, Rock Island, Hay Canyon, which is the new bridge on, on the highway to Leavenworth. Uh, we're looking at working with Uber and Lyft and other innovative services as a ways, again, to provide service in some of those uh, low-density areas. It's kind of hard to work with them, and there's not very many of them right now, and that's one of the questions in our community is, are, are they going to develop enough to actually make that a viable option for us to, to, to use? They've been really effective in some of the large urban areas, but it's kind of a question whether that's going to work here, so we've kind of put it a few years out and said, let's investigate it. It's been very effective where they've done it, but I'm not sure it can work here, but we want to take a look at it before and rather than dismiss it. 
And then we have other investments that are also were included in, in the ballot initiative, uh, Chelan Park and Ride, a Cashmere Park and Ride, some improvements in Shaston, uh, and those are all things to actually make the commute trip between Leavenworth and Wenatchee faster. Um, that corridor actually carries currently about 500 people a day between Leavenworth and Wenatchee, both directions. Uh, um, we have both reverse commutes. We have from here up there as well as from the down down there to uh, Wenatchee. And the potential in that corridor is actually pretty high if we can get the travel times closer. And as the congestion is built both in Leavenworth and on North Wenatchee Avenue, the travel times have been increasing. And so we need to look at how we can keep the bus more on the highway, keep the speeds up, reducing stops, making them faster. And there's some investments in some of these park and rides and stops that would allow that to occur so that the travel times can be a lot closer to what a car would be to make it competitive for people to use that, to encourage that and be able to reduce the demand on North Wenatchee Avenue, for example. Uh, we've committed to some improvements with North Wenatchee Avenue to some transit improvements as that imp those improvements get funded through the city and the state that we would be part of partners of those. And uh, with how many millions do you have for that? Yeah, I know it's yeah. an expensive project. Well, and, so. and, and I, this, this one is <laughs> on this because this one is one of the ones that was significantly impacted by 976. Yeah. This was all assumed that we were matching state grants. And the state grant programs that we assumed we were matching were eliminated by 976. So what I've told the board is, realistically, we can fund maybe two of all these projects over the next Bob 10 years. Bob Manchie Avenue and then one other. Well, <laughs> and then that's going to be the discussion. <laughs> so uh, that'll be part of the political discussion going forward. So that's what we have going forward. Um, as I was indicating, we're starting to see some really positives. Our October was our highest ridership month we've seen in 18 years. Uh, December was the best December we've had in 28 years. We had a 17% increase in ridership over last year. Uh, we had a 9% increase over November of last year, and uh, it's doing quite uh, those. It's we've been pumping the ridership, doing quite well. It's uh, holding up positively. Uh, the evening services are not overwhelmingly used. We didn't expect them to, but they are generating the ridership that we thought they would they would do over time. And we have real high op uh, expectations that the weekend service will, over time, generate the economic activity and the ridership that uh, will justify the uh, in, uh, expenses we put forward and the voters' support. So what do you attribute the increase in ridership in October and December? Um, I think part of it was we'd operated most of that expanded service for about three months, and it takes a while for people's oh, okay. travel patterns to change. You, you put something new, if someone's been getting someplace, they got to, well, I'll give it a try, and then if it works, well, maybe I'll make a difference, and it, it takes a while to, to have that feed in. And When you start a new system, we say you really should be evaluating it 90 days to give you a quick sense, and then realistically nine months before you make any sense of whether it was success or not. And, and before you decide to cancel something, you got to give it at least 18 months to two years because it takes a while for people to make decisions about a service. And it's also why you don't just put things in willy-nilly because you have to make a commitment for a couple of years if you're going to put them out there uh, because it, it People make decisions of where they rent apartments, where they lived, based on the availability of services. So you need to make sure that the services are actually there and are there for a period of time. So we think that's starting to feed back. We've also done some marketing on those systems out there. Uh, on the on the other side, um, price of gas started going back up again. That also has an impact, and I think that was part of it. And um, in Leavenworth, um, the festival season started, and the congestion really made a big issue there. We were really focusing on trying to make our shuttle work and the new transfer, and I think that word got out. There was a lot of stories in the paper, and we saw a lot of ridership increase there. Um, that worked fairly effectively. Our During the Christmas lighting, our Leavenworth ridership was, on the Fridays and Saturdays, was two and a half times what they were uh, the month before on those days. So, I mean, we, we actually did do what we were hoping to do and got the tourists onto the buses and uh, we're using the, the service to do what we were hope, hoping to achieve with that. I mean, it wasn't overwhelming. I mean, we, you know, we're moving 450 people on a, a lighting weekend when you have 15,000. That's not huge, 
but considering we moved no one last year, that's a nice yeah, improvement. That's a couple hundred less cars. Exactly. <laughs> so. Well, Richard, congratulations to you and your team for getting the vote passed last year. And um, I certainly hope that the board of directors, I know Jim isn't one of these that, uh, you know, the will of the voters indicated exactly what they wanted. And I hope your board <coughs> looks at what you're proposing and agrees to fund it the way that I think the voters asked them to fund it. So uh, that's a, an important important part of your board's role so hopefully they get there yeah uh, I'm, I'm optimistic we'll, we'll get it forward and like I said the trends look really positive uh, just one other thing uh, we also turned on uh, December 1st um, an online tool um, that if you uh, download something called my stop you go to the app store you can download uh, some an application called my stop by avail and you click on link transit you can bring up our route network uh, you can look at any bus in the system. If you can stand at a bus stop, it'll tell you when your next bus is coming. It'll tell you how many people are on board the bus. It'll tell you how far behind it is. You haven't and downloaded my stop yet, have you? Yes. You did? Because I saw you the other day waiting for the bus. Well, there's sometimes uh, I don't bother to look at it. Because okay. <laughs> just because you can with technology yeah, doesn't mean exactly. you have to. Yeah, exactly. And, I, and I, I, I do like the, uh, that you added the, 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 f the ability to do the fare thing. I, I just, I'm just very hopeful that sometime... We'll actually be able to go to something similar to the Orca card for it's just so much easier to yeah slap the tap something. card yeah. Um, yeah I'm I'm not optimistic about that yeah, yeah um, uh, Olympia went to the ballot uh, about six months before we did and they had committed to integrate with the Orca card as part of one of their commitments in the ballot and when they figured out what the cost was to bring the Orca card to Olympia their board decided to go fare free that was cheaper than buying the technology to uh, uh, put the the system and they figured it was going to cost them close to $12 million to put the equipment to read the fares. We only bring about $600,000 a year in fares and I haven't <coughs> found a technology that costs less than two and a half million dollars and yeah. I've had a really hard time make the, to make that business case that spending two and two and a half million dollars to collect 600,000 makes a lot of sense. So that, that's, that's why we've been yeah. things like the phone app and the other technology yeah, trying to find I actually, something that works. I went to the Orca card because when I'm over on the other side, I don't want to worry about what the fares are. Yeah. Just too hard to figure out during the different periods of right. time. Yeah. Ours I mean, are pretty simple. Yeah. yeah. And, and and that's <clears throat> I mean I the technology's nice. It's just I'm, I'm, it's just incredibly expensive to make it work. And I, I wish there was something simpler. It certainly seems like there should be, but we haven't been able to find anything that works at our scale. That's that's been the that's been been a goal of mine for eighteen years. <laughs> so All right. any questions for Richard? I just have a comment. I'm, I'm encouraged to hear you're looking at the direct routes because I know a lot of people are frustrated with all the transfers they have to do and the, the amount of time that takes to get. So, uh, you know, Pullman's transit system years and years and years ago, that was one of the nice things I liked about it was you could get on one bus and you could get where you were going. So, yeah, and that, that, that's, that was one of the key goals the board adopted a, a couple of years ago before you went to the ballot was uh, one, one of the goals was that our travel times from major destinations would not be more than 25% more than what it is driving yourself. That we had to, you know, if we're going to be competitive, that's what it needs to be and not 50% yeah. you know, two or two and a half times what it is in your own car, which on most of our routes is what it ends up being because we're focused on coverage as opposed to speed. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Richard. Thanks. Glad you were here. All right, let's go ahead and knock out a few action items. Uh, got a few of them, one public hearing. So the first action item is regarding the Homeless Grant Award to the Powerhouse Ministries. So Glenn DeVries, turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Mayor, members of the council. Um, the City of Wenatchee is the, provides the administrative oversight and function for the Schland Douglas uh, Homeless Program. And the City of Wenatchee is one of seven voting members um, on the task homeless task force and in December the task force reviewed a proposal uh, submitted by the powerhouse and Min um, ministries they have a low barrier um, a homeless shelter in East Wenatchee uh, they've recently had lost some funding and are going through some uh, transitions in structure and uh, obtaining new funding sources and they had a uh, request for uh, three months of uh, funding to help them through this transition time. Uh, if you recall, the city of Wenatchee recently uh, approved two severe weather shelters 
And these day shelters are an integral component for their severe weather shelters and um, for the, the homeless in general, uh, providing a place uh, for the people in crisis to, to be during the day and also um, provides a location where outreach workers can provide wraparound services, um, trying to um, uh, help uh, folks find uh, a way, a uh, step up and a path forward. Um, so these day shelters that uh, provides an integral component of the overall range of services. Um, the task force uh, is recommending that uh, a total of fifteen uh, a total of fifteen thousand um, dollars be allocated for uh, powerhouse min ministries in two components. The first component would be provided initially in a, a month and a half period, um, and then the second component provided at such time when uh, powerhouse ministries provides uh, some of the things that they're doing now as far as their plan going forward. Uh, showing that they've got a financial plan to, to be uh, solvent, um, and they're actively working on that and making good strides. Um, but they felt strongly that this is a, a, a very important component uh, to fund and, and maintain uh, for the overall services in the Valley and would stand for any questions you might have. Glenn, my question is just you know, why the uh, day facility is so important rather than a 24-hour facility because it, it seems like the big need would be at night when it's so cold so those are those are my questions is is, is this the right place to spend our money rather than looking at a facility that can house them full-time well, that's a good question and and typically um, communities uh, a, a lot of the overnight shelters um, a lot of times actually many don't operate during the day. And so having a location where service providers can uh, locate where people can um, you know, have access to food and, and other uh, items is, is an important component. Um, you know, if you have um, our low barrier sh shelter need for an overnight facility is still uh, something we haven't addressed. It's our biggest need in the homeless program. Um, but until that time, you know, having a, a place where folks can go during the day where they can access services um, and then um, there's a linkage and by contract this would be set up that um, the severe weather shelters actually bring the folks from the severe weather, weather shelter and they bring them to the stay facility okay. uh, so that they're, um, and it's set up that way for the churches so that um, the church can then transition to their day use, but they're brought to the shelter so then they can have uh, outreach workers work with them on services uh, so that they can uh, hopefully make some progress. So this is more to work hand in hand with some existing night facilities that yes. aren't open during the day. So this right. kind of correct. Yeah. So it's, okay. it's really important that that integration be maintained. And until we have a low barrier shelter that provides the whole range of services, these day uh, facilities are really important. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Where where are we on the you know the, the path to getting that low bar low barrier shelter? Has there been any recent progress? I know you reported, uh, your staff reported on some options and things like that. But are we are we moving forward on that, or is that we are? It, it's uh, it's not quick, <laughs> um, but we are working on it, um, and and we're looking you know um, at uh, funding partners. Um, you know, something will be coming before you for $1,406, um, which can be used. We're looking at other examples uh, for low barrier shelters. Um, you know, the typical model, say, in Spokane or Seattle, um, and how they staff and man that doesn't necessarily apply very well here, given that we don't have the funds to support it. Mm -hmm. uh, can be some great models. So yeah, the last number we saw, if we want to staff a low barrier shelter is $1.2 million. We've just got right. some, that's sort of the full yeah. meal, how you staff it with people. So we're obviously looking at not quite that model. Yeah. And then you know, again, still trying to find a place and we're still working on a place. But uh, I had a phone call this week that wasn't returned. So I'm yeah, still working on it. Okay. And we got two leads on shelters and other smaller jurisdictions that we're going to follow up and research on how they run their facilities. So trying to get a model, we're trying to get a champion, we're trying to get partners, and we're trying to get a location. And it's one of the uh, work 
action goal items uh, for this year. And so we're, we're fitting that into our program and, and trying to make progress on it. Thank you. Any other questions for Glenn? If not, I'd entertain a motion if we had one. Your Honor, I will move for City Council to accept the Homeless Housing Task Force recommendations and authorize the Mayor to enter into a grant agreement with Powerhouse Ministries for Low Barrier Homeless Day Shelter Services. Second. Motion by Council Member Harold, second by Council Member Bailey to accept the Homeless Housing Task Force recommendations and authorize the Mayor to enter into a grant agreement with Powerhouse Ministries for Low Barrier Homeless Day Shelter Services. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Hi, right, Brooklyn. A couple of annexations. <clears throat> is this actually the final time we see them, or is this? Uh, for these two, yes. Excellent. So we're we going to celebrate afterwards. Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Brooklyn Holton. I'm the Housing and Community Planner. Sue Matchy. <laughs> Hello, new council members. Um, Hello. The first... Isola. So the Isola Annexation um, Ordinance 2020-02 uh, is the final step in the annexation process. Um, this one went through, was one of the first ones to go through the county's boundary review board process. So it has taken almost an entire year. Um, but tonight we held the public hearing um, a couple months ago prior to this going to the boundary review board for um, review. And so that's why we don't have to hold one today. Uh, when we're looking at the ordinance. Um, this does include five properties, um, kind of down at Methowen Terminal, so on that south end of town. Um, and basically, it's the final step. So if you have any questions about it um, or concerns about the way the ordinance is presented, um, the next step <laughs> after this would be um, notifying all the utility providers um, and anybody that has interest in the properties and then getting a census completed um, so that our GIS and our um, tax base can be updated. But this will be the last time the council sees it. Yep. All right. Some of us council members and mayors have seen this now for the fourth time. So this is At sort least of a new, not, not a new uh, <laughs> concept for us. So Travis and Jose, if you have any questions, if not, I'd entertain a motion. Well, Your Honor, I'd make a motion for City Council to adopt Ordinance Number 2020-02, providing for the annexation of an unincorporated area that includes five parcels located on the north side of Terminal Avenue between Methouse Street uh, to the west and extending towards Cross Street, stopping at approximately mid-block, also known as the Isola Annexation. Second. Motion by Councilmember Bailey, second by Councilmember Hornby to adopt Ordinance 20. 20-02, providing for the annexation of an unincorporated area that includes five parcels located on the north side of Terminal Avenue between Methouse Street to the west and extending towards Cross Street, stopping at approximately mid-block, also known as the Isola Annexation. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Same song, second verse, Tramp Annexation. Yep. Same exact. Um, so this one is a property that is just kind of a, a chunk of property that did not get included in a previous annexation process. Um, and so it was just kind of cleaning up and uh, making a more congruent UGA boundary um, and also providing that last piece of um, the Trant property into the city limits. So same, same process. This one and the Isola annexation were basically on the same timeline. Um, so you've seen this one quite a few times, and it's gone to the Boundary Review Board as well. Right. Any questions for Brooklyn? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Um, Your Honor, I'll make a motion for the City Council to adopt Ordinance 2020-03, providing for annexation of the unincorporated area located to the west of Skyline Drive and Millerdale Block A without street frontage and bordered to the south and west by urban growth area boundary, also known as the Tramp Annexation. Second. Motion by Councilmember Hornby, second by Councilmember Esparza to adopt Ordinance 2020-03, providing for the annexation of an unincorporated area located to the west of Skyline Drive in Millerdale Block A without street frontage and bordered to the south and west by the urban growth area boundary, also known as the Tramp Annexation. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 
Thanks, Brooklyn. Thank you. Hill Park, David. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Dave Erickson, Parks and Recreation Director for the City. Um, so for the new council members, in case you don't know, Hale Park is located at the end of South Worthen Street, just downstream from Pibus. So if you go to Pibus, hang a right, go to the end of the road, you'll run into the park. A uh, quick trip down memory lane uh, to kind of update you where, where we started and how we got to where we are now. 2013, uh, we received the donation of the property from the Hale family. We used the value of that property as a grant match in 2014 and applied for some state grants and were successful. And went through the design process and all that community design process to come up with a plan for the park. Uh, we used the funding from 20, that 2014 grant to build the first phase of the park, which included the off-leash area that's down there, uh, utilities, some uh, landscaping work, some trail work, fences, uh, and also parking. Uh, at that same time, 2017, we applied for some state and federal grants, and we're also successful on those. Uh, so in um, 2019, we started phase two development, and that included the skate park uh, portion of that project. Um, that was completed in September. Uh, and then from December 4th through December 18th of last year, we conducted an RFQ process to select a a contractor to do the engineering, bidding, and construction management of the rest of failed, uh, uh, phase two to complete the park. Through that process, we received three submittals, and Pacific Engineering was selected by an evaluation committee as the top-ranked uh, consultant to complete this project. So staff is requesting that the mayor be authorized to negotiate and sign the consultant agreement, uh, so that way we can start on the rest of this project. Um, with, with your approval, we're hoping that uh, engineering will take about the next couple of months, be out to bid for construction in spring, and have it open and, and ready to go by October. And that'll conclude that project. Um, this phase of the project includes adding kids' play equipment, a restroom, a picnic shelter, some additional landscaping, security cameras, extending the trail, uh, and some lighting. I think those are kind of the main project. Any elements. additional parking? No additional parking in this phase, no. Okay. No, and back when we were looking at that, initially when the park was being designed, we had a, a couple of different concepts which expanded parking into the park and in, kind of increased it, but it took up so much more of the park space that we were wanted to at least provide more park space at that time. Okay. So we kind of did a compromise and kind of Do came you, in, Any long-term thoughts of additional yes. parking? So okay. long long-term, we'd like to expand to the north acquire gotcha. the vacant lots that are down there, uh, and then expand that way. In fact, we've designed the existing parking lot to be able to expand that direction. Have we spoken with the property owners about that yet? I haven't talked to them yet, no. Okay. And the other, the other thing, too, is once the pedestrian bridge is expanded across the train tracks, that's going to open up that south end, too, to more foot traffic and, and right. ease of access. Okay. Uh, David, what's the, the uh, price tag on, on this second phase? Yeah, so round, the total you know, round the numbers. Total second phase is a million dollars. Okay. Um, well, one point one. Uh, some of that's already been spent for the skate park. So the the mm -hmm. balance is mm -hmm. about seven hundred, eight hundred thousand at this point for the rest of the project. Okay. Good. Thank you. And that's that's all grant funded. Yeah. We expect nothing less from you than to have everything grant funded. <laughs> <laughs> we try. Yeah, I know you do. You did a great job. Yeah. Any other questions for David? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Your Honor, I'll make a motion for City Council to authorize the Mayor to negotiate and sign an agreement with Pacific Engineering for Engineering and Construction Management for the Hale Park Phase 2 project. Second. Motion by Council Member Esparza, second by Council Member Kulas, to authorize the Mayor to negotiate and sign an agreement with Pacific Engineering for Engineering and Construction Management for the Hale Park Phase 2 project. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, David. Thank you. Cleveland Avenue Sanitary Sewer. Hi, Jeremy. You look like <laughs> Rob. You were the, you're the sewer expert today? I, I am, actually. Uh, Excellent. Uh, 
man, I've made those of you that know Jeremy, I said, hey, Jeremy, I'm, I'm happy to cover this issue tonight. He said, oh, no, I will be there. He, he would never miss an opportunity to talk about sewer. <laughs> uh, I guess he changed his mind. So, um, so uh, that's fine. Uh, so just to bring up to speed, we had a, we had a sewer main failure on Cleveland Street. Uh, we, our crews had been um, trying to keep it on life support until we could put out a full project um, here later this spring. <laughs> Uh, but what was happening was we had a pipe failure. We had a sewer back up into the Christopher house. And when it occurred the second time, we said we need to get in there right away and fix this uh, section. The pipe had fully co collapsed, and we just couldn't uh, allow that to continue. So through our emergency work um, procedures, we proceeded ahead. We, had, we called four of our contractors who did sewer work for us in 2019, asked them to come out and review the job with Jeremy, there's a picture in your packet of where that is at on Cleveland. And uh, three of those submitted bids last week. And uh, KRCI was the successful bidder on this emergency work. So they, you've been by there. They've started work already. And so the reason we're here tonight is our procedures, we are allowed to move ahead in an emergency. And then we come to council asking that council approve this work and allow the uh, mayor to sign that uh, contract. Any questions? They got right on it. Yeah, they they were working early, late, even like yesterday. Yes. It was dark and they had lights going and they were digging. So, Rob, what's, oh, please go ahead. Uh, with the pipe, you know, fully collapsed and they're in there working and whatever, what, what's the, where's the sewage going? Plan, plan B for, <laughs> for the, for the sewage that's going. Well, they, they have in their contract, they have a, a pump around requirement, so they're keeping everybody active during the project. So they, yeah, they have temporary lines that they've, oh, okay. they've laid that they pump around while they're putting in the new sewer. Okay. And, and this section of Cleveland is a concrete street. It'll be re resealed in concrete. It, that's correct. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, okay. Not, not immediately. It'll be asphalt for now, and then we're going to put on a bigger project that'll be probably done next year, this year. And then it'll be concrete. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, there's been a little bit of a change in that this week, and so uh, we will be restoring with concrete to answer your oh, question. Okay. But but uh, there was uh, the rest of the main that was in good shape, and uh, given all of the other competing interests for sewer and water funds, in this case we have an older water main there. We decided let's fix this 80 foot section, and uh, and then reevaluate. So we may come back later this year, or we may delay it until the year. But we will be. We will be repairing the street with a concrete patch. And I appreciate Jeremy's explanation why the project had to get going because I was walking by oh. and I'm going, uh, we haven't approved a contract yet. So when I <laughs> looked at my agenda packet, it was, yeah, I appreciated the, the narrative. So if you could pass that on to him. All right. And next time uh, when we do this, because they consulted with me, I also, I'll shoot you an email. I just got to remember it just so that, that doesn't happen that you go, well, you never approved. I could have emailed you <laughs> middle of last week, and, and I didn't. But. All right, any other questions for Rob? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Your Honor, I make a motion for the City Council to approve the award of the contract for emergency repair of the Cleveland Avenue Sanitary Sewer, Project SW19-10 to KRCI in the amount of $77,343.40 and further authorize the mayor to sign the construction contract. Second. Motion by Councilmember Huffaker, second by Councilmember Kulas to approve the award of the contract for the emergency repair of the Cleveland Avenue Sanitary Sewer Project SW19-10 to KRCI in the amount of $77,343.40 and further authorize the mayor to sign the construction contract. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Rob. Tell Jeremy we missed him. <laughs> Surplus property sale. Brad. Brad. Matt. Why did I say Brad? Oh, Brad gets, Brad gets the money. Matt's selling the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure out how that works. Yeah, that's Matt. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Matt Shales, Development Project Manager. So tonight I have for you the option to sell surplus property. So this property was originally purchased by the city of Wenatchee from Northwest Wholesale um, to facilitate the building of North Columbia Avenue, which 
you have um, in front of you on your packet and then also uh, the McKittrick extension. Um, so here's North Columbia Ave. Oh. It was kind of working. It was kind of there. <clears throat> yeah, so okay. the property in question um, is in uh, red dashes in your packet, and then it's in that kind of orange color for the folks on the big screen. But uh, North Columbia Avenue is will be situated here, and then McKittrick will extend down through here. Mm -hmm. So um, property that's not associated with those uh, transportation improvements were surplused by the city in 2018, and that allowed staff to negotiate um, the sale of that property. And so um, the property that we're talking about tonight had the old uh, Northwest Wholesale concrete tilt of warehouse on it, which was directly behind Smitty's. That's gone now. Um, the this, this city removed that in the last month. And so we have a um, draft purchase and sale agreement with Steve and Carol Freeman for the purchase of roughly 33,000 square feet. Um, the price of that property is the sale of that property would be seven hundred forty-one thousand one hundred thirty-two, and that's based on twenty-four dollars per square foot for um, near thirty thousand of it. And then there's uh, about five thousand square feet that is at uh, twelve dollars per square foot because it is encumbered by utilities. Uh, the final price will be determined by the actual survey of that um, parcel, and the. So the purchase sale agreement has been signed. They've included their um, earnest money. The city does have an obligation to build North Columbia Avenue by December 2021. We're proposing to start work on that next year in 2020. That's this year, just that's, so you know. That's this year. <laughs> <laughs> it's just way later this year, though. And yeah. so this is, this yeah. is my question is how comfortable are we that we're going to be able to complete uh, Columbia by December 2021, and what happens if we don't? Not that we haven't had a hard time with that area getting projects it moving is. and going, but yeah, it, you know. Anyway, you know where I'm coming from. Yeah, we feel comfortable that we can complete North Columbia Avenue by 2021. That if we do not, well, there's no. <laughs> it's got to be done by December 20th. But, but well, well, if it isn't, I've what, been assured this what is our liability? I am. <laughs> Stuff happens. We'll it's be, supposed we'll be to out be done, mostly done by the end of this year. Yeah. We'll be out there with our crews if we have to, right? We can send the crews out and start <laughs> knocking stuff down and putting pavement in. I, I'm confident we'll get it done. I don't yeah, know what the agreement the says. About ready to go. We don't have any more right away. But if I'm sorry, but what if do we do we know what our we what probably our have default to we probably have to forfeit it or we restructure the deal. And if you restructure the deal, the property is going up in value. So okay. Freeman is going to look at us and say, "Just get it done." Okay. Right? They're all going to say the same thing. Yeah, I mean, there you could be a with that damage position? claim for yeah. not having it done, but yeah. I don't know what that would be. But but we all know stuff happens. You yeah. find problems there's a pipe there we didn't know about there you know there's stuff that happens that gets us delayed one other thing i'd like to note is so i think that agreement provides for a closing date of february 28th yeah. uh yeah or when the plat alteration is complete yeah, yeah. but the latest oh. is february 28th and we we just went through this whole process and our timeline will be probably the end of what did we say april and we're probably going to come back with an addendum to with extend addendum. the closing date yeah. The, getting the plat amendment is just going to take some time. Or if the council wanted to, they could authorize me to sign it and give me a longer date to execute it if they wanted to. Right? We would, we would that. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't have to come back. They could authorize the mayor to negotiate yeah. and sign, and uh, and as part of the agreement, part of my author authorization would be to change the closing date to April 30th if you wanted to. And I could just that would be good agreement. because then yeah. we don't have to bring it back. And prices, I mean, I know this is 24 is what we sold. Uh, 
Les Schwab too. I know that's the sort of the price for the stuff behind uh, Nationwide, so we're comfortable with the 24 bucks. Yep. Okay. Okay. And if you guys remember, this is adjacent to the property that hooked on Toys bot. Right. right. So hooked on Toys bot the stuff on the other side of Columbia, but to the railroad tracks. Right. Yep. And then the Freemans are the ones uh, for <coughs> Travis and Jose are the ones that actually own Smitty's yep. and own the property next to it. So they'll have long, shorter. Do you know, do you know what, we're, what they're planning on doing there? Uh, Not that so it matters. It but. doesn't really, I, I don't really know. I, you know, the, the Northwest Wholesale Building is down, the office building. You can sort of go where that one is. Can you get us to the, so that's gone, yep. right? Mm -hmm. yep. And that one next to it is the next to go. As part of the McKittrick, we had to take half of it. So it's all yep. coming down. So he will own, if you think about it, he'll own, just kind of keep, yeah, he'll own all, all the way down Wenatchee Avenue. So he'll have a huge block and he'll go up, then he'll go all the way up and he'll have that whole section. Mm -hmm. So my guess is Smitty probably stays and he'll probably try to sell it to somebody <laughs> for something. It will be very nice property at some point. So I, he hasn't really told us what his long-term plan is. I don't yeah, anticipate. Yeah, more curiosity than. I don't anticipate Smitty's moving, but I do anticipate something going in its place. Wow. It's quite a piece of property to own when it's all said and done. And that was really part of this deal, was to try to get those property owners to own narrower lots that went deeper to Columbia Street. Mm -hmm. right, so if we do a motion with the uh, <clears throat> small change to the closing date of April, End of April. April 30th. Is that all yeah, right? That works out. So, Your Honor, I'll make a motion for the City Council to authorize the mayor to sign the purchase and sale agreement with Steve and Carol Freeman with the change that the closing date would be extended to April 30th and further negotiate any final details of the agreement. Second. Motion by Council Member Huffaker, second by Council Member Hornby. To uh, authorize the mayor to sign the purchase to sell agreement with Stephen Carroll Freeman, subject to changing the closing date till uh, April 30th if necessary, and to further negotiate any final details of the agreement. Discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank Thanks, you. Matt. All right. Cultural Resource Specialist, Steve. Yeah. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Steve King, Economic Development Director. Uh, tonight we, ha we have before you a, um, an agreement with the Wenatchee Valley Museum to perform a special project for uh, the Haran area and Confluence Parkway. So uh, in the, uh, 2019, we did a similar contract, and it worked out very well. Uh, Randy Lewis came and presented uh, the information the research that they uh, performed in the uh, Confluence magazine for Travis and Jose. There's a um, great R uh, Confluence magazine from last quarter I can get you. It explains the uh, Native American history associated with Confluence of the uh, Wenatchee River. And so uh, we want to continue that work this year. And Randy helps us um, uh, work with the tribes, both the Colville Confederated Tribes and the Yakima Nations. And uh, we're learning a lot about the history of Wenatchee through Randy's uh, depth, in-depth knowledge. When we uh, met with the Colville Confederated Tribes, they said uh, Randy is the one that knows Wenatchee history, the, the Native American history. So um, this agreement allows the museum to work with Randy. And uh, uh, next week, we actually go to Olympia to present to the Heritage Caucus in Olympia, um, there's some property in the area that we would like to consider for uh, a cultural uh, heritage site, and so um, Randy will be joining us, and this helps helps all that work get done. So that's uh, the nuts and bolts of it. If you're happy to answer any questions. And having Randy on our team for the NEPA process has been extremely valuable and helpful. Plus, he's sort of a hoot. We never get a chance to spend time with him. <laughs> Yeah. I think it's Steve King's brother. <laughs> <laughs> Something about OMAC. Yeah, I know, yeah. So, Your Honor, I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Your Honor, I would make a motion for the City Council to approve an agreement with the Wenatchee Valley Museum <coughs> for cultural resources work with Randy Lewis. Second. Motion by Councilmember Bailey, second by Councilmember Harold uh, to approve an agreement with the Wenatchee Valley Museum 
<clears throat> for cultural services <clears throat> work with Randy Lewis. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and take one more item, then we'll just take a quick little bathroom break and then do our public hearing. So next item is regarding our mayor pro tem for 2020. So the council gets to select who gets to be the mayor when I either get hit by a bus or I can't show up for work. So I don't know under the turnsies routine how that works, but well, as a good. matter of fact, you know, be Mark or Jim, yeah, it would be Council Member Bailey is the longest to go in 2011, followed by me in 2014. So if 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 it's okay with you, I'd make a motion that uh, we uh, designate uh, Council Member Bailey as the Mayor Pro Tem for 2020. And note in the uh, resolution uh, 2000, or excuse me, 2020-01, uh, that Council Member Bailey be uh, Mayor Pro Tem for 2020, and that uh, the wording in Section 1 be revised to reflect 2020 instead of 2019. Mm. Second. So we have a motion by Council Member Kulas and a second by Council Member Esparza to appoint uh, Council Member Bailey as Mayor Pro Tem for the 2020 year and recognize that the resolution uh, be changed to use the appropriate dates. Questions? Jim, you want to give a speech or anything? No, I right. don't have to campaign, I don't okay. think. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> uh, hearing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. You guys want a break? You want to keep going? Where are you at? I'm fine. We good? Let's just keep going. All right, here we go. All right, so we have a public hearing item, or a public hearing item regarding a contract, <clears throat> a franchise agreement, excuse me, with Charter Communications. So for public hearing items, we'll hear from our staff first, then we'll hear from uh, any members of the audience that wish to address the council, then we'll turn it back over to staff for um, their uh, uh, proposed action, if any. So Rob, you, uh, you got it? I do. All right. Um, this is, a, a, you may recall, so uh, just to, again to give a little bit of background for the new council members. So uh, franchise agreements are used to allow utilities to be within our public rights of ways. And it lays out the rules and regulations for them to have their things in our right of way. Um, all of the utilities in, in there that are privately owned, such as the PUD, PUD utilities, in this case, charter communications, um, any, any that you can think of, they have to get a franchise agreement from us before they're allowed to be there. Um, so this, uh, this uh, franchise agreement was first adopted by the council in 1995. Um, it was renewed in 2013, and it technically expired on the end of 2019. We've been working with them um, through 2019 on the renewal language. In, in most of its form, it's the same as it always has been. There's been a little bit of change in, um, uh, in the cable rules. I'm looking at Brad. Uh, yeah. So, um, but for the most part, again, we're focusing on their use of, of, of our right of way for their facilities. Um, we had a public hearing on December 5th. There was no comment at that time. We had been working again with a one last little bit of language with, with Charter Communications, uh, and that caused us to continue this process on December 14th, um, which brought us to tonight. So we've that language, we've worked that out with Charter, so the black line version you have in your packet has been reviewed by staff and by Charter Communication rep representatives and are, we're recommending approval. Um, we do, would recommend that you go ahead and open for public comment if there is any, and then uh, we recommend approval. Mm -hmm. so, do you have any questions of me at this time? Uh, yeah, Rob, just, just quickly, I mean, the, the, the disputed language that we kind of put this off was was the uh, the if I remember correctly and correct me if I'm wrong it, that was over the the amount of time uh, I can't remember the details now it, <coughs> it was ten years or seven seven years or something and there was some con um, concern about it was, it. correct there it was in section eight point one zero which has to do with relocation um, we are um, we get if the what you're referring to is is the amount of time if we ask so if we ask today for charter to relocate their facilities on our behalf due to a city project they have to do it for free and so they wanted some assurance that we couldn't come back in the next year and say oh we goofed you need to relocate again and <laughs> mm. for free right. and so that is a, a 
uh, an area of negotiation, they ask that they be allowed the same clause that we give the PUD, which is that if we ask them to relocate again within 12 years, mm -hmm. that we would pay for that. Um, we talked about that as a staff. The likelihood of us asking them to relocate and then asking them to re move mm -hmm. again within 12 years is really, really slim. Okay. And so we felt like that was a, a fair request. So that, so that was okay. So, so it's 12 years at this point. It is. And the agreement itself is 10 years in length. Uh, the ex I have a question. I can look at the expiration. I think it's, it might be 10 with an option to, to extend for 10. Yeah, section 2.2. Well, it's entirely possible that we asked them to move something four years ago, right? And then we couldn't ask them for 12, so that would be part of that remove would be part of this. Unless we renegotiate yeah. in 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The 5% franchise fee, is that pretty standard? It is. Okay. And then this basically represents the last red line version that we got. There was no additional changes after that. Is that correct? correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions for Rob before I turn it over to the public? All right. Any member of the audience wish to address the city council on this public hearing item regarding our uh, charter communication uh, franchise? Your Honor. I motion the city council to. Oh, we're not quite ready yet. We're not quite ready. ready. Almost. <laughs> well, we'll wing you in a minute. Okay. The number, no ahead. members of the audience wish to discuss this. All right. I will turn it back over to the council for any action they Excellent. may be willing to take. Your Honor, I <laughs> motion for city council to adopt ordinance number 2020 04, renewing the grant of a franchise to Spectrum Pacific West LLC, locally known as Charter Communications, to operate and maintain a cable system in the city of Wenatchee and approving the franchise agreement setting forth the conditions accompanying the grant of the franchise. Second. Motion by Councilmember Cueva, second by Councilmember Huffaker to adopt ordinance 2020-04, renewing the grant of a franchise to Spectrum Pacific LLC, also known as Charter Communications, to operate and maintain a cable system in the city of Wenatchee, and approving the franchise agreement setting forth the conditions accompanying the grant of the franchise. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That concludes our public hearing. We've got uh, two additional items. We've got a mayor's <coughs> report and then our new uh, business of the council committees. I guess I'll do the mayor's report first. Um, I always look at my calendar to see what's sort of going on. Uh, obviously, this is the first time we've sort of met. Um, I... Uh, on the 30th, uh, before we did our swearing in, we did have a regional water meeting. Um, at some point in the next month or two, you'll probably see a request to expand the water service area in East Wenatchee. So as you know, we're partners for regional water with Shelan County PUD and the East Wenatchee Water District. And the East Wenatchee Water District wants to expand the water system into an area that we haven't agreed that they could do that to. It seems to make sense in terms of where growth is going. So. I expect in a couple of months you'll get a re we'll get a request from staff to, to look at that. It'll have to be approved not only by us, but Sean County PUD and the East Wenatchee Water District as well. Uh, I have met um, with staff regarding the low barrier shelter. We're just not quite there yet. I did meet with Sean County Commissioners on uh, Tuesday, uh, and that went well. I did speak at Rotary on Wednesday. I think that went well again. Transportation Council met for the first time this week um, and uh, fairly quiet. I will be in Olympia, and Steve, this is for you. I need to go over Tuesday morning bright and early because I am giving Representative Steele's housing bill is getting a hearing at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. So I'll be in Olympia all day Tuesday and the first part of Wednesday uh, with the stuff that Steve was talking about regarding um, uh, regarding some, perhaps get a grant for some cultural uh, purchases. Other than that, I'm sort of doing part of Allison's job, which is unusual for me, because, uh, but uh, we are trying to work our best without that. And um, again, we may have some news in the next uh, week and a half or so regarding uh, her potential replacement. So not ready to discuss that yet, but we're, we're getting closer on that. Um, so let's, you want to do our, uh, let's look at our council assignments. Are those in the packet? No. I didn't they are no, not. We're going to discuss those next week, I think. Are we doing that next week? Yeah, oh, I session. knew that. Okay. <laughs> I thought we were doing that tonight. Okay. Uh, so, council members, any committee work? You've been meeting, doing anything? 
I've been making my tour. I know. So I, you were at WDA, and then you were at transportation this morning. Yep. Okay. You were at Rivercom. Following Ruth around. Yeah, at Rivercom. <laughs> Excellent. What's the most exciting meeting so far? Um, uh, Transportation Council. Okay, yeah. Most exciting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good opinions there. Okay, excellent. Jim? Uh, yes. Uh, the, uh, Richard Drock was here giving his presentation earlier. Uh, the, the kind of the next big step is uh, starting next week. We're, we have a subcommittee that's going to begin the RFQ, uh, RFP pro, um, process to hire a consultant to do the, you know, an over a look at the whole bus system and what many things that Richard kind of referred to is going to depend on, uh, as he said, the, you know, the, the, the current system and has been in place for a long time was basically all about coverage. Uh, but uh, as things have changed, we just want to take a complete relook at the whole thing and make, make adjustments as necessary. Uh, the direct routes thing, for example, is really, really critical. So that, that process is going to start. It's going to be a, a while. It's not going to be anything, you know, quick here, but, but uh, it's going to be a, uh, really a major uh, move for the, uh, for the link system because it hasn't been done since inception. So uh, almost 30 years later, taking a, taking a look and saying, what, what do we need now and into the future as opposed to what we've had for almost 30 years. So at any rate, I'll try to keep you posted on the direction that goes. Good. Keith Mark? Anything Swain new? Douglas Health was uh, approached by uh, Julie Ricard, PhD, yes. and she works for NCWA uh, Advisory Board, and she would like to implement a needle exchange program in our area. Uh, kind of a controversial subject, but I thought I would bring that back to council, see if anybody had any interest. I have a flyer I can send you if you'd like to read about it. Are they asking you to vote yet? They are not asking us to vote yet. They're asking us to uh, inform ourselves and, and get a little bit of uh, more information, but I'm sure it'll be coming back. And uh, right now, I would say that it probably would not be approved, but they brought up some good points during the meeting, and they have some good statistics, but I don't know... What to trust? Yeah, so you that's because you can always you can always give information that right. looks the way you want it to look, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So occasionally, and not very often, I can't remember in the last eight years that we've ever done this, where we've taken a position as a council that would ask somebody, "Hey, when you go to your committee and this comes up, we want you to vote a certain way." This might be one of those if you are interested, or if the council feels like they want to chime in on that particular issue. It doesn't happen very often, but if you're looking for something from us, I'm looking in for terms input from the council because, again, I know how I feel about it, but I'm one vote, I'm one representative. Right. Um, what I would like to do is maybe send this document to everybody. Okay. I'll send it to Tammy and have them distribute it to you. So if it gets, and then maybe we can bring it up at work session and okay. for another quick discussion next week. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. I just, yeah, if you're looking for some guidance from the yeah. your partners as to how you might vote. Yeah. Okay. Let's plan on doing that. Okay. The other thing, I would like to uh, thank everybody, staff and everybody, for getting the restrooms at Rotary Park opened. How's that working? That is working extremely well, okay. except New Year's Day. Okay. Was it closed? It was closed. Okay. <laughs> and I felt bad because now everybody got used to it. And yeah, okay. We got mooned several times. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Other than New Year's Day, it's working well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. I can't believe most that. of the time it's good. Yeah. So oh, thank you goodness. for uh, yeah. getting that done. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll say something to David. For um, next week's study session, can we uh, put on 10 or 15 minutes for the council to talk about what sorts of items it would like to hear about in study sessions for yep. 2020? Yep. I know that I we've, got we've been a little delinquent on ourselves, not yep. advising the mayor and his staff the issues that we're finding it that we want to discuss. Okay, yep. And we, I know we've got a sort of a preliminary list over the next couple of months, and so we'll, we'll add yours to that list and, and, yeah. And we really didn't get a chance to visit about it during our training, but uh, we had talked about, you know, getting packet information out a little bit earlier so that we have the full seven days to review that, so maybe we could also discuss that in the future as well. Yeah. 
I do know it uh, from staff's perspective or from the department heads, you know, we work pretty hard. I see an I know, agenda usually sometime late Friday and then again Monday and Tammy's waiting to get stuff. And so I know sometimes it sort of, and at the end of last year when we were sending you 600 pages, um, well, and, yeah, today's was. And, and again, I think it's important, yeah. important to point out that we're not bringing this up selfishly. Right, yeah. We're talking about helping our staff out as yeah. well yeah. And, and help them do advanced planning and not feel like they're rushing. Right. To run this stuff together. Yeah. I will not be here next week. I will be either calling in or late arrival. I'm not okay. sure. So okay. I'm uh, in Canada for a conference. Okay. And then the w following week, I'm attending the AWC <coughs> conference because I'm on the education committee. Okay. <clears throat> Perfect. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? All right. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.